Go ahead and hit record too. There you go. Hi everybody, Dr. Wohler here for uh, Great Plains Lab for another monthly installment of these complimentary webinars from Great Plains Laboratory. So uh, if you've heard me talk before, this may be a, uh, a webinar that you might be familiar with. I've changed it up a little bit. And I really want to go through some information, but I also want to have a uh, a discussion of things, if you will, because this is an important topic. It's about biomedical intervention for autism. And, you know, I've been doing this now for um, well over 20 years. Um, not only just functional medicine, integrated medicine, but biomedical intervention. I've been doing a lot of education now for Great Plains Lab for many years. I actually teach their organic acid test seminar, and I've been doing these webinars now. I can't remember how long, five, six years now. But I also do a lot of my own education. So I'm the co-founder of Integrative Medicine Academy. I'll talk more about that towards the end of this talk. This is an online training academy with different courses for healthcare practitioners. I also am the developer of a website called Autism Recovery System. So if you're a parent or a caregiver of an individual with autism, that's a place you can actually access me for ongoing questions. And so I've worked with the autism community now since 1998. I also work with other patients with autoimmune and neurological uh, types of problems. Um, and let me just give you a little backstory on myself. So in 1997, 1998, I was actually working in San Diego, California. I was just new into practice. And we got a flyer. I was actually at a doctor's office I was working with. And he did a lot of nutrition and some different kinds of alternative medicine. I was really new to the game back then. And we got a flyer about a conference coming up called uh, Defeat Autism Now. It was being put on by the Autism Research Institute, which was actually based and still is in San Diego at the time. And I remember telling this colleague of mine that my only reference point for autism was the movie Rain Man. So I actually was in college when Rain Man came out and it had a, you know, a significant impact on me, but I never thought that I would ever be in practice sort of working with an individual like um, the, the character that Dustin Hoffman portrayed. So, but again, that was my only reference point. And so we went to this Defeat Autism Now conference, what it was called back in the day. This was again, 1998. And I still remember being overwhelmed by the amount of information that these doctors were talking about from fatty acid problems to gut issues to immune system issues, et cetera. And, but I, did re, I do remember hearing Dr. Shaw from Great Plains Lab talking about this test called the OAT. And so I left that conference totally overwhelmed got back into my practice and within a week or so, I can't remember the details now, my office manager came up to me and said, are you treating autism? <clears throat> and I said, no, I mean, I just went to this conference and apparently when I registered, there was a form that you know, stated, would I be willing to be a biomedical autism doctor? And I obviously checked yes, as I was registering and they took that information and ran with it and there was probably a lot of other doctors that did the same thing. And so that began my journey into this concept of biomedical intervention. And I saw my first patient probably within the first month, didn't have a clue about what to do, but I, I did have a, remember this organic acid test. And so I ordered that and I still remember, you know, the, the mom who came in with her child had already had her child on a gluten casein free diet, was already doing some basic supplements. The organic acid test came back and it was all of these, these markers and names of things that I hadn't really heard of before. And so I actually got on the phone with Dr. Shaw and he recommended doing some antifungal treatment, which I did. We did some nice statin and that, that process took about 18 months and that child regained their language became much more social, lost their diagnosis, and essentially went off into mainstream school. And so it was an early success, but again, I didn't expect things to really develop from there. And so I started doing some public lecturing in San Diego around the time, health food stores, local support groups, and things kind of grew over time. And for the first 
three, four years in practice, I would periodically see an autistic child and, and try to do what I could do. And then things really kind of took off from there. And in the early days of this, what they called the DAN movement or the DAN conferences or the early days of biomedical intervention, which biomedical is this implementation of diet supplements, targeted medication. You know, the gluten casing for diet was discussed back then. And it was always highly effective and still is actually a very effective uh, therapy. Dr. Rimland of the Autism Research Institute talked a lot about high dose vitamin B6. And we know that B6 has a positive effect on neurochemistry in the body. It can help with dopamine production, for example. And so that was often used. And then of course, you know, the understanding about digestive yeast and candida and bacterial problems, that was even discussed way back then. And it was really Dr. Shaw that was leading the charge for that information. Mercury detoxification was huge. This was right around the whole time of the thimerosal controversy. And so everybody was jumping on board trying to do mercury detoxification or chelation therapy. And then there were other therapies too, like methyl B12. And so any one of these could be helpful and still are helpful in select cases. <clears throat> But what I realized even back then, and, and it's even more important today, is that there really is no one drug, one supplement, or a magic bullet therapy for autism. And the symbol that represents autism, this puzzle piece, is very appropriate because it's very true. There are no two autistic individuals who are exactly the same. They all have their own unique puzzle. They're all unique individuals, no matter what age they are, whether they're a child, teenager, or an adult. And we could make that statement about, you know, other patients with other types of health disorders, but the autistic individuals very much are true of that. And so the reality is, is there really is no one type of autism. There's many types of autism and it manifests in different people in different ways. And there's different triggers for it. But there are those foundational therapies that seem to help, at least at some level, a, a certain percentage um, in most everybody. And of course, I can't make the claim that any one therapy is going to be 100% effective in 100% of the people. There is no medication that can do that, or supplement, or diet. But there are certain interventions that are done certain puzzle pieces, if you will, that have a significant impact, particularly when they're put together with other therapies. Okay, so again, there isn't that, there isn't that magic bullet, but you know, still conventional medicine and even part of integrated medicine or biomedical intervention still exist kind of in this, this magic bullet type of scenario um, where people in many regards are sort of throwing darts, kind of hoping that something sticks. And I understand that. I understand the desperation. I understand the stress. I understand the fear and the concern that parents and caregivers have. Because as a physician um, who's now worked in this population for, again, over two decades, I've worked with people from all over the world, and everybody is concerned. And the doctors are concerned and the researchers are concerned because it is a concerning problem and it's not getting better. I mean, the, the numbers of autism are increasing, not decreasing. But the amazing thing is, is that we have the ability to really make a difference and provide hope and provide healing for many individuals with autism. And there are a wide variety of therapies. Okay, I just mentioned a few of them, but what, I'm, what I've noticed over the past number of years is that there is a still a tendency for people to just sort of jump into these different interventions without really doing some of the fundamental work. So it's uh, things like leucovorin, which is the use of high dose folinic acid. Well, it, you know, it can be helpful for a certain subset of kids, uh, but not all. Um, and it's not always appropriate for everybody. Metal detoxification is not the end-all be-all for all individuals with autism. I, 
I've never believed, and nor do I believe today, that all autistic individuals have heavy metal toxicity. We all are exposed to heavy metals, um, but not all of them have mercury toxicity. I mean, I do some work with a, a group out of China, and I can tell you, based on their testing, the vast majority of autistic kids in China have mercury toxicity, have lead toxicity, but that's not necessarily the case of all of everybody here in the United States. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy, a wonderful therapy, and can be extremely helpful. It's expensive. It's not always easy to access. But again, it's not universally helpful in all circumstances, particularly if it's one of the first things that's tried. I see a lot of people now coming back and circling back wanting Namenda or this medication called Nemantine. Well, Namenda is actually a medication for Alzheimer's. And the, if you understand the mechanism of what it does, it can be helpful in certain cir circumstances. But it's not something that would initially or should be tried first. Antivirals like Valtrex, there is a subset of kids where that might be appropriate but it has its downsides, right? Any of these antivirals can be stressful on the liver. They're not always appropriately used, um, nor are they always 100% effective. But again, sometimes people jump in and say, well, let me just do the antivirals and everything will get better. High-dose Motrin, steroid therapy, et cetera. So there's a lot of these things out there where they might be appropriate in certain clinical circumstances. So many years ago, I started seeing this trend and I still see it today. And I started working with what I call the four pillars. And the four pillars was a term that, uh, that, that, I, that I came up with to sort of assess or, or, or look at biomedical intervention in a, in a broader sense. In that if we don't address these four pillars, many of these other types of therapies, the leucovorin, the, uh, the antivirals, the HBOT, whatever, usually aren't going to help that much. Okay, and I, you know, notice I didn't say are not, I said usually are not. That doesn't mean that those couldn't be helpful in isolation in certain cases. And for me, the dietary intervention has always been the first thing that needs to change with anybody, whether they're autistic, whether they have chronic fatigue, whether an individual has an autoimmune disorder, you know, there's always room for improvement in diet. Foundational supplements, filling those in those holes nutritionally critically important, digestive system assessment, and then methylation. And so the four pillars are that. It's diet, supplementation, digestive health, methylation. And then we have this group of other interventions. But I never start and never have started in the other intervention box. I've always encouraged other practitioners and parents to start within the four pillar approach. Okay, again, diet, gut assessment, etc. Because by and large, you will usually get a greater effect from other interventions when you've addressed or continue to address these foundational four pillars. And I realize there are certain kids that are doing the four pillars and then we'll move off into other interventions such as I just mentioned. So if you're a parent that's listening to this, one thing that's really important is that you feel comfortable that you're working with a practitioner who is taking a systematic approach to your child or your loved one's clinical situation. And that means being able to take a clinical history and dissect their clinical history that's unique to them. So to me, autism is not something that where we just have this cookie cutter approach or a protocol. There isn't an autism protocol. It's very specific and unique to the individual because every child has their own story, their own unique characteristics. There might be similarities and there may be similar therapies or testing that are done, but first it needs to be teased out based on their unique clinical presentation. And then lab testing complements it. Because again, we're not treating the lab, we're applying the lab to the, to the clinical scenario of 
the individual that we're taking the history from. And whether, again, whether it's a child, teenager, adult, it's the same principle. And so this kind of approach is really applicable to individuals without autism. Okay, they could have, again, some other kind of health condition. But again, it, it, you're, it's important that you're working with a practitioner who, one, has the training, two, has the skill and the experience to be able to dissect things down, um, to try and figure out what is actually real and what is actionable uh, and doable. One of the things that we know is that the conventional medical community, for the most part, not everybody, certainly not all doctors, but as a general statement by and large, does not do a very good job at assessing for many of the underlying biological problems that are known to exist in autism. In fact, some doctors just flat out either ignore the problems or are prejudiced, what I, what I call prejudiced by the diagnosis. So I saw this many years ago in practice where you could take a child without autism who may themselves have behavior problems, attention, uh, anxiety issues. They're, they're manifesting with physical issues of diarrhea or bloating, gas, um, maybe chronic infections. And usually in that child, again, they don't have a diagnosis of autism, the, they'll get some testing done. A doctor may say, hey, let's do some blood testing to make sure we don't have an immune problem or let's do a stool test to make sure there's not an infection. But the minute the, the autism label is given, you could take almost that exact same child with almost the exact same behavior and physical problems and they're often overlooked or ignored. So again, the medical community doesn't do a great job in understanding what are called the comorbid conditions of autism. Many of these comorbid conditions manifest as gut problems. And so digestive system issues, whether it's loose stools, diarrhea, uh, or diarrhea, constipation, bloating, gas, cramping, um, it all tends to worsen the behavioral aspects of many autistic kids and teenagers and adults as well. But the reality is, is that autistic individuals tend to have a higher rate of digestive system problems. Certainly not all of them, okay? But it is an area that needs to be appreciated and needs to be assessed as a fundamental pillar of biomedical intervention. In fact, there's been many doctors that have, who work in the realm of gastroenterology, Dr. Bowie is one of them, who understand that problems within the gut can lead to behavioral problems often seen in autism, and that to just give some kind of psychotropic medication is doing nothing. In fact, it could make the situation worse. We've seen kids with severe self-injurious behavior because of gut pain, because of bowel inflammation, because of toxins that are manifesting in the digestive tract that are affecting them behaviorally. Some of these kids have small bowel inflammation to the point where they actually are being diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease. Not every child has small bowel inflammation or inflammatory bowel disease. Not every child has the same overgrowth patterns of bacteria or yeast, but it's an area that needs to be appreciated, always taken into consideration, and one of those areas that should be assessed for with even just stool testing to identify functional status within the gut. Because if it is occurring, sometimes the behavioral issues, the sleep problems, even physical growth and well being can significantly be compromised. So we know that autistic kids can have gastritis, they can have reflux, they can have colitis, they can have irritable bowel. It's even suspected that a fair number have what's called SIBO or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. There is testing for that. The, the difficulty with children is doing what's called the SIBO breath test. It, it's a complicated test to do and not all individuals with autism can do it successfully because they have to follow a specific set of instructions. 
that that isn't sometimes actually isn't easy for adults to follow. So some of these things are suspected, some can be confirmed by testing, but what is crystal clear is that gut issues and autism is a common comorbid problem. In fact, if you look at the uh, statistics from the Center, Centers for Disease Control, they even acknowledge that gut problems are a major comorbid, uh, comorbid problem. So the gut has a direct connection to the brain and nervous system. In fact, the gut can affect brain and nervous system function directly through uh, transportation of toxins through nerve pathways back into the brain, but we also can develop toxins in the gut that get absorbed into the bloodstream, cross over the barrier into the brain, and then start to interact with different uh, areas in the brain, different neurochemicals in the brain that can lead to behavioral problems, can lead to attention problems, can lead to focusing problems, et cetera. And this isn't new information. Um, this information has been out for a long time. It's just that many people either overlook it or they just don't know about it. And one of the reasons that I do so much teaching on the organic acids test from Great Plains Lab is because it is a fundamental test to have done for every single individual, I don't care what age they are, whether they're two or 92, who has an autism spectrum disorder. This test really is more of a profile. You could break each category down into an individual test. It's a complicated test. I teach an entire day seminar for Great Plains on this test. And that's just scratching the surface. I have two online courses through my Integrated Medicine Academy that's strictly involved in the interpretation and, fit and clinical uh, um, application of this test into clinical practice. The markers that the organic acid test provides just for yeast uh, and candida exposure are significant. It even gives some representation of mold exposure. And these chemicals like arabinose um, and tartaric, for example, can have negative effects within the brain or nervous system. They can also affect things from the physical level within our cells. They can affect energy production and um, you know, different things. So these things are toxins that can have an adverse effect, again, on autistic individuals. Matter of fact, the manifestations commonly of yeast and candida, candida is a type of yeast, are often seen things like goofiness, getting, get, uh, getting a silliness or inappropriate behavior, high self-stimulatory behavior as well. And then we've got the clostridia bacteria. These clostridia bacteria, there's many of them. There's more than, you know, there's a lot of other types of clostridia bacteria other than what's called C. difficile. These two can have a negative impact on the brain or nervous system. But many times the clostridia bacteria can lead to behavioral issues, aggression, self-injurious behavior, for example. And so the organic acid test is a wonderful test to assess for some of these imbalances. Now, that doesn't mean that every autistic child has profound problems with yeast or clostridia. Uh, most do, but not all. And so we'll have to many times do other types of testing to be able to identify potentially other problems. But the oat test, what's called the organic acid test, is really the hub of the wheel. It's a, it's a foundational test to have done because it provides so much information. Now, the first pillar of this four pillar approach, as I go back in time and think about how things have developed over the years, it always comes back to diet. And, you know, diet is not an easy thing to change in all circumstances. Some kids can take to dietary changes very easily. Others, it's a, it's a struggle, if not nearly impossible in some cases. So again, it can be unique to the individual child but it's also a family affair. It's not just something that's done for the autistic child. It's really, in many cases within the family unit, something that the family needs to, to do. So again, everybody's situation is a little bit different, but one thing is clear. 
Dietary changes are important, and many times that's just changing the quality of food to a more wholesome diet. And then, of course, there are elimination type diets that eliminate certain types of food chemicals or food proteins that are known to adversely affect the brain and nervous system of autistic individuals. The reason the gluten casein free diet has been around for as long as it has is because one, it works. Two, the science really shows that these casein and gliadin, what are called gluten proteins, not only can affect the immune system or the digestive system, but they can cause interactions chemically within the brain and nervous system. They're opiate type of chemicals. They interact with opiate receptors in the brain or nervous system, which can affect attention, which can affect focusing, which can affect behavior, which can affect language. And so as a fundamental diet, um, again, it's not always a magic bullet and it certainly is, you know, it's not that, but it can many times have a, a profound effect in the early stages of biomedical intervention to just lessen the negative impact that some of these foods can have on the brain or nervous system. And then there are other diets, the specific carbohydrate diet, often used for individuals with inflammatory bowel disease or a lot of bacteria and yeast overgrowth in the gut. The GAPS diet, and you know, another famous diet. But one thing to keep in mind is that there is no one diet that's going to be 100% effective in 100% of uh, autistic individuals. We know that dietary changes are helpful. In some kids, the changes are profound. In others, more subtle, and there's going to be a few where it doesn't seem to make much of a difference. And it would be nice to sit there and say, well, everybody should do the GAPS diet because that's the one diet to do. Well, it's not as simple as that. Um, not everybody should be doing the SCD diet, nor is it necessary to do something like the specific carbohydrate diet in everybody. So as much as, as, much as we'd like to, to take every individual with autism and fit them into a certain diet box or a certain supplement box. It just, the reality is it, it doesn't work that way. And I've been doing this now, you know, for a, a long enough period of time to know that it's very much an individualized approach. Food sensitivity testing is another test that we commonly do to give some insight into certain food reactions because these foods can trigger inflammation. That inflammation can affect the gut. It can affect the brain and nervous system. And so this is at least some way of assessing for some types of food response. So a common profile that I'll do in my practice is do the organic acid test and then do, some, do the food IgG test as well. Um, to give some insight and then work on diet from there. So this is a test that I, I feel, for the most part, everybody should have it done at least once. Now, I have a couple exceptions. I have had a few cases, and I actually had a case recently where the autistic child ate basically three foods. So, I, I mean, their diet was so extremely limited that to do a food IgG test really wasn't necessary because it wasn't like we we're gonna try and restrict their diet even more. And there are certain autistic kids who have extreme eating pathologies where they actually need to work with a, uh, a feeding pathologist or a feeding therapist to get them to actually eat more food. To me, the second pillar is nutritional supplements. And, you know, there are, I have many talks on different types of nutritional supplements. Um, this particular part of this talk is really about the, just understanding that when you have an individual with autism who is restrictive in their diet, they're going to have certain nutritional imbalances. And Certain nutritional imbalances can be detected through specific lab testing, and then 
you know, others are just um, in many regards, uh, you know, kind of felt to occur because of a lack of diet diversity. And so when I say nutritional supplements is part of the second pillar, what I'm really getting at is that as a foundational approach, I really believe and have seen clinically in my practice that these early supplements, multivitamin, mineral, antioxidant, essential fatty acid, calcium, magnesium, for example, they help to fill in the gaps nutritionally. And so as you fill in the gaps nutritionally of certain B vitamins or certain antioxidants, you start to eliminate some of the underlying subtle biochemical imbalances that might be occurring. And in some cases, when you do that, you'll actually have kids that will respond positively. That might be in their behavior, that might be in their eye contact, that might be in their awareness. Now, nutritional supplements usually doesn't stop at that point because there may be more things that are revealed the more types of laboratory testing you do. But again, those foundational early um, supplements of the multivitamin, the essential fats, the calcium and magnesium can many times have a profound effect at improving an individual's overall cognitive uh, development at a certain level. I use a lot of supplements from New Beginnings Nutritionals for autistic individuals. The individuals at New Beginnings Nutritionals are um, well-versed in the special needs community. Many of the parents that work for that company have special needs kids. They understand the supplements. They understand how they taste, what, how things are mixed, what mixes well, and what type of food or drink, because that's always going to be an issue with any child. Whether they're autistic or not, some kids just don't like taking supplements. Um, and so you have to try different things and different tricks to get them to do so. And so in my experience, New Beginnings has always been well versed in helping parents kind of figure that out and you know what to do. Now, the third pillar, this kind of takes me back to the to the early days when I first went to that GAN conference, because I remember the doctors talking about gut problems. And I still remember hearing Dr. Shaw talk about candida and the overgrowth of candida. And, you know, it's as true uh, now as it was, you know, 20 some odd years ago, the candida problems and the yeast issues in autistic individuals still persists and is still incredibly profound. And one of the things that happens is that these organisms produce different organic acids, different compounds that get absorbed into the body and get, again, can have an adverse effect on the brain and nervous system, affecting attention, affecting focusing, et cetera. And autistic kids usually tend to have a lot higher levels of these and are also more affected by these compounds. That's not to say that neurotypical kids couldn't have some of these. It's just that the autistic kids tend to have a lot more of it. But again, not every single autistic person has a candida problem, okay? That's where the testing comes in. And if something doesn't show up, you know, we're not making stuff up just to do treatment, okay? I mean, many times lab testing is just as important to rule something in as to rule something out, to check it off our list. But one of the things that does happen with ongoing candida issues is it can lead to breakdown of the digestive system such as leaky gut which can increase the propensity for food sensitivity and that also increases different types of chemical compounds that again can adversely affect behavior i mentioned before that yeast organisms are known to produce um, compounds that affect behavior like alcohol and so the goofiness, the giddiness, the, silly, the silliness, the inappropriate laughter, well, it actually has a reason. It's being triggered in many individuals because of the chemical production of digestive yeast. But for many years, there's been this view of candida and autism as though it's some kind of a simple fix. And I wish I could say that it is. The reality is, is it isn't. 
um, it's not always a simple fix. In some cases, it's a, it's a struggle. And the, the, what's important for people to understand is that these organisms have been around a lot longer than we have as humans. And there is a percentage of them that live in our digestive system at a certain level normally. And if we have a normal, healthy digestive system and we've got good bacterial diversity, for the most part, you can keep these yeast organisms in check. But there is gonna be a subset of people, including autistic individuals, who just continue to have a struggle with the overexpression of candida. And some of it just, it's not easy to figure out or exactly known. There are other factors that can contribute to ongoing yeast problems. So this is where you have to start doing your, de you know, the detective work to start putting other pieces to the puzzle. It could be food sensitivities. It could be heavy metals. It could be toxic chemicals. Clostridia bacteria in the digestive tract can often create imbalances. So this isn't about doing an organic acid test, seeing elevated levels of a, of a yeast, and then just you know throwing antifungals at somebody and hoping it all goes away. That, but that also means that you don't do anything at all, okay? Because if something is present and these pathogens are present, it's been my experience that it warrants some type of treatment. Okay, but it's again, it's, it doesn't just come down to a medication or a supplement. It in, involves a process. And that, again, goes back to that first pillar, working to improve diet, working to improve the diversity of other of bacteria in the digestive system, which is improved, by the way, through a healthy diet, as well as things like probiotics identifying other factors, other opportunistic infections or other chemicals or other exposures. There are many fine supplements. New Beginnings actually has some great products for digestive system issues. I really like the combination botanicals, things that have a multitude of ingredients. They kind of throw a wider net, so to speak, and can have more of a eradication or suppressive effect on some of these opportunistic yeast. Okay, berberine is another kind of supplement that again can be effective against yeast and bacteria. For a lot of the autistic kids, I've had tremendous success over the years using biocidin, whether it's in the capsule, whether it's in the regular liquid form. The capsules are very small, generally easy to swallow. The liquid form actually tastes good, unlike a lot of liquid botanicals. The company that makes Biocidin has done a lot of research into the effectiveness of this remedy, whether it's against candida or bacteria, biofilm, for example. Um, these, their products are often used in autism or other sensitive individuals who've got ongoing gut problems small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, for example. Uh, but one of the biggest, you know, the biggest advantages is, is that they're, they're palatable. Um, and that makes a big difference as far as administering these supplements to kids and they're highly effective. Their biocidin LSF, which is a liposomal form of this supplement is extremely powerful actually. Um, and is kind of an advanced way of, of getting after some of these digestive bugs. So New Beginnings actually carries these supplements. You can also get more information from uh, the uh, company Biobotanical Research directly. Nystatin, an ant uh, a very effective antifungal medication. It's only available via prescription here in the US anyway. And again, it has great effect against candida. In many cases, it can be used for you know, long periods of time. It's not universally helpful in all cases. In fact, many times botanicals and some kids are even more effective, but it's on the list of considerations. And then we've got the systemic antifungals as well, things like diflucan. These are not to just be used randomly. 
They need to be used selectively in certain circumstances. Again, it's this one is prescription, so you have to get it from a doctor. Um, and this is something that's used more in spurts, right? It's used for maybe 10 to 14 days at a time, more for what's felt to be systemic candida. But because of the negative impact it can have on the liver, it's generally not something that's advocated to use for months and months and months on end. But it can be effective. And so, but again, it all comes down to the clinical circumstance. Not every autistic child needs to be on Diflucan. Not every autistic child needs to be on Nystatin. Um, it's working with a practitioner who can or who notices or uh, knows the difference and where things may be appropriate. One thing I want to bring to your attention, and this is some newer information that's actually come out this past year as something as it's linked to underlying chronic candida problems, and that's the presence of mycotoxins. Great Plains Laboratory added their mycotox profile to their menu. I forget how long it's been, maybe a year and a half, two years now, um, if that. And it's a urine test. So I'm encouraging people to do this test when they're, you know, in many cases doing um, a urine, let's say for their organic acid test when they're collecting that. Because the mycotoxin test is assessing for these things called mycotoxin. These are these toxins that are produced by various mold. And these mycotoxins will or can cause immune system issues. They can lower what's called secretory IgA, which is the main immune chemical in our digestive system. And when you lower secretory IgA, you increase the potential for opportunistic bacteria and opportunistic problems like candida. They can damage mitochondria. They can deplete antioxidants like glutathione. These things can be picked up through food, moldy food, as well as moldy environments. So a home, office. I've had a number of kids over the years where it turned out they were being exposed to mold at school. This actually happened with my own son when he was in third grade. I still remember going to his first day at the, uh, at the school, this is in Southern California, and I walked into the room. The first thing I noticed was the teacher. The teacher was like antisocial, but there was something about her that she had a bit of a tremor and she had a flat effect on her, just the way she, her, her appearance. And I, what struck me as being a doctor was there was something neurological going on with her. Um, we weren't in the classroom for very long, but we came back a couple weeks later to observe our son in this classroom. And I started to smell mold. And I watched the teacher and she was struggling up in front of the class and she was kind of irritable. It was really kind of amazing that she was acting the way she did when my wife and I are actually sitting in the classroom. But to, you know, to, to the short of it is, is within three months that classroom was shut down. All of the kids in that classroom were transferred to other classes throughout the school. We pulled our son out after six weeks. And it turned out the school admitted that there had been a water main break in the, that section of the school and had flooded a couple classrooms they had a mold company come on and they did find mold was growing uh, in the walls of that classroom. The teacher ended up getting transferred to another school because she said the room was making her sick. And I can see why, she's probably mold toxic. So on the organic acid test, there's actually markers that indicate exposure to certain mold. So markers two, markers four, markers five, even marker six is now felt to be linked to aspergillus mold. Okay, so you can see in this particular child, we've got high levels of aspergillus exposure along with very high levels of candida. So there's a lot of fungal problems happening here. But I don't just stop at the organic acid test because the organic acid test doesn't test for these various mycotoxins. It only indicates the presence of certain molds. You have to do the mycotoxin test to figure out 
what mycotoxins are present. Aspergillus mold is a very common mold. In fact, most water damaged buildings have, you know, at least one of the molds that's causing a problem is aspergillus. But every once in a while, you'll do a mycotox test and you might find this particular one here, uh, Verucarin A, comes from stocky botrys mold. This is found in a 20 month old living in a house with their five year old sibling. Okay, where there was mold damage and they've got black mold growing in the house. Okay, these are extremely toxic compounds. And you're not going to pick up on stocky botrys mycotoxins from the oat test, from the organic acid test. One of the other mycotoxins that's common on these tests is what's called okra toxin. And okra toxin comes from aspergillus mold. And just recently, um, this was back, when this come out? 2019. So these researchers were looking at mycotoxins in relationship to autism. And what they found was that okra toxin, that's what's abbreviated here is OTA, okra toxin, was found to have, um, uh, to be significantly much more elevated in autistic individuals, um, or I should say, was impairing them in a more significant way uh, than other individuals um, in some very unique ways. It turns out that boys, males, don't express certain liver detoxification enzymes that help to degrade okra toxin. So if you think about the, the rates of autism, right, it's four to one boys to girls. I'm not, I'm not making this statement here, nor are they, that this solely explains the four to one ratio in autism boys to girls, but if we've got males that don't express certain liver enzymes that help to break down okra toxin, well, males are gonna tend to have a higher potential problem with okra toxin exposure. It also turns out that okra toxin um, can lead to leaky gut. Okay, just like candida can lead to leaky gut, so can okra toxin, that which increases inflammation, which increases food sensitivities and overgrowth of intestinal pathogens. Okra toxin is also immune suppressive in the gut. It turns out that okra toxin interferes with a certain enzyme in the brain that helps to make dopamine. So it can lead to dopamine imbalances, which can lead to neurochemical imbalances, mood problems, learning issues, etc. Now, if we have a good diversity of bacteria in our digestive tract, we can at least somewhat minimize the impact of okra toxin. It, it may not do it 100%, but another reason for a good healthy diet and diversity of food and probiotics is that things like lactobacillus and bifidobacterium can help at least lessen some of the toxic effects of okra toxin. There's another common mycotoxin that shows up on the test called mycophenolic. Mycophenolic comes from penicillium mold. Again, this is not something picked up off the oat, it's picked up off the mycotox test. But what mycophenolic does is it decreases immune response to allow for increased expression of Clostridia bacteria and Candida that the organic acid test will actually detect. Another aspect that's very common in autism is Clostridia bacteria. And Clostridia bacteria can really wreak havoc, not only within the digestive system, but also from some of the chemicals that pr they produce that can affect the brain and nervous system. Dr. Shaw has done a lot of research on this and one particular chemical that the organic acid test helps to identify for is called HPHPA, which is often high in autistic individuals. And what it does biochemically is that it alters the function of, or I should say metabolism of dopamine. Dopamine is necessary for attention as well as norepinephrine. And what these compounds do, such as the HPHPA or this particular chemical do, is they 
interfere with this enzyme called dopamine beta hydroxylase. And not enough dopamine beta hydroxylase activity causes an increased expression of this chemical called HVA. All of this is tested off of the organic acids test. And too much dopamine in the nervous system can lead to behavioral problems. It can overstimulate the nervous system. It can increase the flight or flight response. It can increase anxiety, increase stress. In some cases, trigger behavioral problems like aggression, self-injurious behavior. It can damage the structures within our cells like our mitochondria. It can damage the liver. It can damage um, uh, the ability of the body to produce things like glutathione, which are important for detoxification at the cellular level, as well as our liver. And then all of this imbalance, whether things are affecting tryptophan, whether things are, or excuse me, whether things are affecting serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine, you start to get imbalances in neurochemistry being caused by these different intestinal toxins. You're gonna have anxiety issues, impulsivity, irritability, mood problems, cognitive issues, et cetera. So it shouldn't be assumed that just because somebody has an autism diagnosis that all of their problems are solely because of just some kind of structural abnormality that's happening in the brain. That for some reason, they've just got some intrinsic imbalance occurring with the, with the neurochemicals. Because there are many individuals with autism who are, their imbalances are being either caused or at least contributed because of other underlying toxins that they're being exposed to. The fourth pillar as part of this biomedical approach is probably one of the most complicated um, things to grasp because it's complicated biochemistry. There's a lot of moving parts. It's not just as simple to say, we'll give a little bit of you know, B12 or DMG supplement, for, for example. This takes us off into a whole other area of genetics, which in and of itself is challenging and difficult. But to understand methylation is to understand many of the characteristics of autism, from lack of awareness to language problems to eye contact issues. Um, detoxification problems, et cetera. And there's been a lot of research over the years that have looked at methylation imbalances, okay? And these things are quite common in autism. Many times they're being induced by different exposures. So alcohol or ethanol, well, that can be linked back to digestive yeast. Heavy metals, chemicals, oxidative stress are also known to affect many methylation pathways with that affect autistic individuals. One of the things that we look at, at with regards to this is potential chemical exposure. And this is something, unfortunately, all of us here living on planet Earth have been exposed to, some of us more than others. It's like the heavy metal scenario, right? Not everybody has the same level of metal exposure, but everybody has the same level of chemical exposure. And so you have to test to determine what your environment, what your child's environment is. So Great Plains actually has this GPL tox, this urine profile that looks for a wide variety of chemicals, such as organophosphates, these common herbicides, or excuse me, pesticides that can be sprayed you know, in your yard, at the park, uh, on golf courses, for example, farms. So some of it comes down to where you live. And the, uh, again, it's important to, you know, to do some assessment for that. So, but at its core, right, the four pillars, to me, you know, even 20 plus years into being a physician working with this population, when things seem to be getting out of hand, when we're, when we're working with a child where either we've hit a roadblock or you know, uh, we tried something that's not working, I'm always finding myself coming back to the four pillars. How are things going from a dietary standpoint? What's happening with our foundational supplements? 
Are we having any issues going on in the digestive system that, e that need to be reassessed? Where can we take things uh, and look at things differently, perhaps from a methylation genetic standpoint? Because what I don't want to do as a practitioner, and I would encourage you as a practitioner yourself or a parent, is just to sit there again and throw darts randomly, hoping that you hit something blindly. Um, but to have a, a, a method and a strategy for how to assess these things. Because ultimately, if we're not addressing the foundations of our health, and that's true of ourselves as adults, as well as with our kids, um, many in many cases, we're not going to get the benefit that we would, you know, might normally see with other types of, of intervention. And those other types of interventions, as I just mentioned, are some of the other meds, the antivirals, the leucoborins, these types of things. So autism biomedical intervention is complicated, um, but it doesn't have to be overly complicated um, right from the get-go. And many times just making small changes in diet, implementing foundational supplements, that alone in many kids can make a shift, really change the way they are, the way they behave, the way they interact with their environment. Not every kid needs to go and do heavy metal detox. Not every child needs to do some type of intensive chemical detoxification. In fact, some of these things can come later after you've implemented some of the basics and the foundations. So like anything, it, it all seems to be extremely overwhelming in the beginning. That's why it's, you know, I think it's important for people to come back and say, let's focus on one or two things right now and take a stepwise approach. One of the things that we've had in existence for many years as ongoing educational support is a website called autismrecoverysystem.com. In this website are uh, educational videos. Um, we actually do a monthly webinar, or not month, a month of it, we do webinars um, through the Autism Recovery System website that the recordings get held within this website. There's actually a forum within the website as well, where you can post questions to me on an ongoing basis. You can follow us on Facebook at Autism Recovery System. <clears throat> if you go to Autism Recovery System, you can get a complimentary book right off the homepage, Seven Facts You Need to Know About Autism, if you're brand new to this whole concept of biomedical intervention. And there's actually an entire course within the Autism Recovery System website. There's over 10 hours of lectures, uh, uh, recorded lectures uh, within the site that goes through some of the concepts of what we talked about here, but more. If you are a healthcare practitioner um, and you are interested in learning more about autism, but from a biomedical standpoint or other issues from SIBO to toxicity to adrenal hormone problems to organic acids testing, I'd encourage you to check out our website at Integrative Medicine Academy. We do have an entire online course called Autism Mastery. This is actually the course is currently going on now. People can join it any time. And this is an incredibly in-depth course on my over 20 years of experience in autism from a biomedical standpoint. So the whole goal here is to help practitioners get up to speed as quickly as possible to learn how to implement this type of material into practice. So for more information about the Autism Mastery Course, you can go to autismmasterycourse.com or you can email to autismmasterycourse at gmail.com. If you are a practitioner and interested in organic acids testing, I would encourage you to check out the Plains' website and look to attend one of their upcoming workshops on oat testing as well as other testing that they provide. So this information can be found either at greatplainslaboratory.com or you can uh, do a search for GPL Academy. 
many of the tests that I had um, lit, talked about here, from the organic acids test to the food IgG test to the mycotox profile, um, are accessible through a, a website called Lab Test Plus. So Lab Test Plus, you can email labtestplus at gmail.com if you have questions. You can go directly to the website as well, labtestplus.com, and look, look through the menu of things. What happens when you order through this site is you'll get a written review of the pertinent markers on the lab test, along with what are called action step suggestions as well. So you can access some of these, some of the labs through this website. I mentioned about the importance of diet and nutrition, and my partner in practice, Dr. Trekatella, um, who's been a, a naturopathic physician now for over 20 years, um, has a tremendous amount of experience in diet and nutrition, and uh, she's now opened up her practice to um, expand out uh, to the special needs community um, to work with people, whether they're working with a gluten casein for diet, a low oxalate diet, GAPS diet, SCD diet. Um, she's worked for years with patients with uh, chronic fatigue, autoimmune disorders, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So you can get more information about Dr. Trinkatella's um, nutrition consults directly from our practice. Our practice email is scmedicalcenter at gmail.com. Our website is mysunrisecenter.com. And then if you have any questions, you know, from this, from this presentation, you know, like what labs I had talked about or what labs might be recommended, for example, you can always email those questions um, to our practice and I can try to help you where I can. I'm also available for private consultations to our private practice as well. So, Again, our private, uh, our private practice email is scmedicalcenter at gmail.com. You can learn more about us at mysunrisecenter.com. Okay, everybody, thanks so much for your attention. We'll see you next month for another complimentary webinar sponsored by Great Plains Laboratory. I hope this information was helpful for all of you. I'm Dr. Kurt Wohler. Thanks so much.